Today is December 15th, 2022. I'm Gabrielle Fellows with the Museums of Lake County, and this is an oral history interview with Leslie Miller. Leslie, thank you for being here today. You're welcome. So to get started, what can you tell us about your name? Were you named after anyone? No, my name actually uh, was given to me by my mom because um, uh, she gave me her first husband's uh, last name, Miller. Oh. My, um, my father's name was Macy, the last name, Ted Macy. So that's that about, <laughs> about that question. Okay. Uh, what is your date of birth and how old are you? I, it is September 29th, 1948, and I'm 74 now. And where were you born? I was actually born in Calusa, California. My mother, uh, when she was carrying me, was actually working in a prune field with um, the rest of my family, a large family. They used to pick fruit um, and then uh, save money for the winter. Well, and then come back to Lake County after they would um, go mostly all over Northern California working in the fruit. Hmm. So um, about three days before we was, she was scheduled to come back to Lake County, uh, she gave birth to oh. me. And um, my, it was in a um, tent setting and they used a prune box for my uh, bassinet oh, when wow. I was born. <laughs> yes. So after that, they brought me back to Lakeport uh, oh, okay. to uh, attend the hospital and go through those procedures. So what were your parents' names? My mom's name was Rose. Her maiden name was Rose Ray, but then it changed to Miller. And then my dad's name uh, was Ted. And like I said, his name was Macy. Um, my mom gave me Nelson Miller's uh, last name. I see. So. And do you have any siblings? I had, uh, um, I have six siblings. Um, four of them are, have passed on. And I have uh, two sisters and one brother left. And um, What are their names? Uh, the ones that have passed away, uh, accordingly, was um, Henry Miller and... Clarence Anderson, and Arveda Pacheco, and why am I forgetting the fourth one? Yeah, the, uh, and then I had three from when we were real young, was Mary and Bruce, they oh, had okay. passed away. And the uh, ones that are still living are Ron, and uh, Sylvia, and Karen. And where were you raised? I was raised here in Lakeport, um, and I was raised by my grandparents. Um, uh, we had a large family, so I would get more attention at my grandparents. So I uh, basically was uh, raised with them and listened to a lot of their stories. Um, my grandfather, Gene Ray, was uh, Cotto uh, from the Cotto tribe in Laytonville, California. Hmm. And my grandmother is uh, Bessie Augustine, who was the granddaughter of Chief Augustine for local fame of the, which transpired around 1850. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I came from a pretty historic family and um, there were chiefs on both sides in the Cotto uh, family and in the Augustine family were chiefs. Uh, okay. And who would you say raised you? Uh, probably my grandmother, because uh, my uh, grandpa passed away at 57, it's mm. quite early. And so, yeah, I got a lot of my um, lessons in life from my grandmother. Okay. And, um, you know, not to say that I wasn't with my mom all the time, it was just, I got uh, a lot more time uh, to learn things from my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And what did your father do for a living? My father uh, in Santa Rosa uh, drove uh, semis and stuff, big, big trucks. And um, he did, uh, as I understand, he did a, a couple. He drove for the county uh, 
with large trucks for the county, but okay. I didn't have too much um, uh, interaction with him because of whatever transpired between my mother and him. Oh, okay. Yeah. Did your mother work outside the home? Yes, yeah, she did. She actually had a little business that she used to uh, clean people's homes for them. She oh. had a housekeeping job that um, she had about six different clients that she would constantly be working. And uh, she, she did pretty good doing that stuff, yeah. How long did she do that for? I would say um, probably about 10 years that she did that, yeah. Wow. And what do you know about how your parents met? I don't. I don't. That was, that was never really discussed. And I, I have nothing to say on that because I don't know. Okay. What, what are some of your earliest childhood memories? Um, well, first of all, one of my, um, one of my favorites to tell, I tell this to my grandkids, um, my first day of school, when the elementary school was on Main Street in Lakeport, right across from St. Mary's Church, that used to be our school. Well, in the first grade, uh, my mom dropped me and my cousin, uh, Aggie Elliott. Uh, we were two weeks apart. We were best buddies besides being cousins. And we started off our early escapades by going to the first grade together. Well, we were so used to being on the Sugar Bowl Reservation that um, we thought we were still in charge of um, even at school. So we, we didn't like to be in school. It was out of our whole setting that we were used to. But uh, we could smell the food in the, in the, uh, from the cafeteria up the halls to our classroom. So um, Aggie said, why don't we eat? This is my cousin. He said, why don't we eat first and then we'll just walk on home. I said, okay. So you imagine uh, two first graders um, just walking out of the, off of the out of the elementary and walking home, which is about four miles away. Uh, they had the the police looking for us and our parents oh, no. looking for us. <laughs> and we were sitting down at this old store on the way home. It was pretty famous back in the day called Nylanders. And um, he owned this uh, little first supermarket up on the north side of Lakeport. And we were, he would let us sit in there and look at the books and he would give us penny candy, so we were sitting there eating, and, and my mom knew enough about uh, Nylander. She goes, they might be in there, so she stopped in, and we were sitting there looking at the books, and the owner I knew my mom real well, and he says, no, they've been in here <laughs> for about an hour or so, so that was our first, uh, one of our first capers that we had together, me and, oh, wow. me and Iggy, which would last 74 years. He died the day before my birthday in September. Oh, wow. Uh, my birthday's on the 29th. He died on the 28th. You were friends that long? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah we, every, we, we were just best buds besides being cousins, you know. Uh -huh. And um, I, used to, I miss him every day. You know, I'm, yeah. the routine of having breakfast and coffee and, and talking about the uh, tribal stuff and just about uh, the world news and all such, he was... Pretty bright man, and he was the one that got our our uh, Sugar Bowl reservation re-recognized to federal trust. What is the Sugar Bowl reservation? Sugar Bowl is the old term uh, before we dealt with the BIA, uh, before they deemed it the Scotts Valley Band, the Pomo Indians. Oh, okay. It's the Sugar Bowl Res Rancheria, is what it was. And uh, that's how... Me and Aggie knew Sugar Bowl. We didn't so much know about Scotts Valley, but uh, Sugar Bowl, we were raised there. We grew up there. Oh, okay. So it was years and years of growing up on the, the old reservation before it was terminated by the federal government. And then years later, he got it re-recognized. Oh. They gave us all the ability to get grants and stuff from the federal and state level. Um, gave us a lot of benefits that federal recognition does, mm. you know. 
So did you have a best friend as a kid? That was Iggy. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I had friends, but not anybody close to our relationship, you know. And did you have any hobbies as a child? Uh, drawing. I was uh, a pretty good artist. Uh, I like to do facial portraits. And um, yeah, I did that clear into high school. Um, used to win safety contests, I remember, out of Sacramento. We used to do it in our art class, and I won about two of those doing uh, drawings. Hmm. And um, baking, I loved to bake because my grandmother and my mother were great bakers. They used to make some great pies and cakes for the holidays and, and give them out around the uh, family because we had about uh, probably about six households in our, on our reservation. Oh. And on and the holidays, she was my mom used to distribute it to all the family so they'd have a pie and a cake, you know, for the holidays. Mm -hmm. And did you have any pets as a kid? Oh yeah, my famous one. His name was Smarty. He was a Alaskan husky, and he was my best one of my best buds growing up. Uh, raised him from a pup. Yeah, I recently I. I didn't care for animals for a long time after he uh, he was put down for biting the mailman. Oh. And um, just recently within about the last six years, I just fell in love with a little white chihuahua that I have. His name was Rambo. Oh. So he took the place of Smarty finally after all this time. <laughs> so he's, he's a great dog too. And did you have a favorite subject in school? It was um, history. Oh. I loved uh, I loved history, world history, U.S. history, and also liked uh, English. I used to love to write, and uh, I got the um, I don't know the h stories of history used to um, make my mind just um, wander about uh, you know the about going to these places all over the world and all over the country, which I did some here in the United States. But it would just, it, it gets your mind going and with, um, you know, what really happened and, you know, the realism of it, you know, mm -hmm. from transferring from the book to the realism. realism. And I was kind of enthralled with the Civil War, which oh. I got to go back to Fredericksburg, Virginia. And... Uh, I went to uh, South Carolina, and it was very, very interesting. And the whole mindset back there, how different it is from California. Mm. So learned a lot of lessons. Uh, New Orleans, I, I love New Orleans, but um, it was a kind of controlled atmosphere down there that um, is completely different in California. Yeah, right. So, yeah. So where did you go to high school? Uh, Clear Lake Union High School. They used to be called Union High School back, back in the day. And I graduated there in 66, 1966, when that year was when the new high school was built. That was the year I graduated from them. Oh. The football field wasn't done. The baseball field wasn't done. We had to go downtown to play uh, at the fairgrounds, play football and play baseball at the old, the old uh, baseball field uh, in North Lakeport there across from the Water Wheel restaurant and Nylanders back then. That was where the store was. Oh. So, um, yeah, it was right, right by the water. And somebody hit it hard enough. In fact, I caught a ball going, running into the lake and I ended up in, in the lake all soaking wet. <laughs> oh. Catch a ball, yeah, that's how close it was to the lake. Oh, wow. But great times, great times. What was it like to go through the school district here? It was, um, it was hot and cold. Um, if we're um, taught, it was the time. It was the time when it started getting very rigid and it started loosening up. And... Um, Racism was kind of a, 
a word that nobody liked to use, but it was in play. And um, we, uh, me and Aggie, we didn't really recognize that because we were so used to getting along with everybody, you know. And, and we did. We had a great time because in a small school district, you go to school with the same people every year. You need to go just you go into a higher class, you know, a higher uh, grade level. So our, um, our school experience was pretty good, uh, except when it came to playing sports in high school. Oh. We were real good athletes, and we were denied, especially in football. Uh, we spent a lot of time sitting on a bench when we were wondering why, why, why wouldn't you use us playing, you know, because we were pretty good in sports. And um, not bragging, but we were great in baseball. Mm -hmm. Me and Steve, because we practiced year round. We just didn't practice during baseball season, you know. So, yeah, it was a, the, from all my friends that I went to school with, um, especially in the baseball segment of it, was great. We, we had a great time. Um, I still touch with some of my old high school classmates. In fact, at Aggie's, after Aggie's funeral, we had a luncheon where uh, three of his close buddies came, uh, high school buddies came to his luncheon, and we had some current um, friends that uh, Aggie knew along with me um, that we introduced them to each other, you know. Mm -hmm. And some of these people were, they retired here in California in Lakeport. Uh, they're from Boston and Philadelphia, um, from Italian descent, and they really, lo really loved Aggie, and they're some of my best friends. So, um, the climate here in the county, which I'm really proud of, has really changed, and I think the significant part of that change was the casinos, mm. and it gave people a a venue to learn from each other. It was there for gambling, but people got talking to each other and communicated with each other better than they would if it wasn't there. So I think it was a hub for educate, educate, education as far as culture goes. And it really has benefited in that regard, the casinos and the restaurants and, and the events that take place there. Mm -hmm. So they've been a blessing in that area, you know. Um, I set uh, on a, I, I'll get that to you in a, in a later segment here about my, um, my time in tribal government. Okay. Yeah. So did you have a mentor growing up? My grandpa, Gene Pop Ray. He was, um, he showed me how to, he could do anything. Um, he could weld, he can fix his big trucks. He can just about do anything, build houses. And he built most of the houses in Sugar Bowl. Mm. And he was just a person that never talked about it. He just did it. He wouldn't um, procrastinate. He used to hate the, that uh, procrastination out of uh, one of his sons. And... I just admired him because I'd go every place with him. And he had this, the old fashioned, big old trucks. And he would sell wood. He would cut wood, take them out to some of the ranchers out in Scotts Valley, uh, the pear ranchers or the pear uh, farmers. And he was friends with everybody. He knew everybody. Him and the mayor at the time in Lakeport um, were, um, when he was younger, um, were good fishing buddies, and they spent a lot of time out in the lake, you know, fishing. And in the dark days, when racism was at its worst here locally, he was one of the few Indians that could go to town. And that's how that racism, how thick it was at the time. But his personality and getting along with people, and besides that, being a 
a bare knuckle fish champion because they used to do uh, bare knuckle fighting back then just to make extra money. They used to bet um, on fights and um, he was good at it. And he used to tell my grandma, um, sis, he goes, <clears throat> I, don't, um, I don't mind beating these fellas up, but I don't like to hurt their feelings. That was his old saying. Mm-hmm. And they, they, uh, my grandma used to laugh at that. She goes, I don't even like you doing that stuff. So, but it was, a, uh, it was tough times about earning money. So they had to find different ways to earn money and cutting wood, doing that kind of stuff. And, and uh, yeah, he would even sell fish to the tourist people that came up oh. and yeah, catfish especially. Mm-hmm. So he was, um, that was my mentor. He showed me, I used to be um, the, the little kid who didn't know how to fight or didn't want to fight. And you had to be kind of tough if you're on the reservation. So uh, other, other cousins would pick on me all the time. And so he showed me how to put up my dukes and defend myself and that that really helped out the rest of my life did you have any goals or dreams for when you grew up um i wanted to be a a a professional baseball player because i was pretty good at it and i thought i was going to go in in that direction and as i got into um high school probably around the eighth grade, I just really took an interest in writing and telling stories and telling um, my feelings about historic events. And um, yeah, it kind of mellowed out there. And then um, I, I've got a, I got an invitation to a baseball facility years back. Yeah, I think it was in Visalia or something like that. But uh, my coach was, um, he gave me a recommendation. But I never, never went. It was just a matter of money uh, back then. It was um, just getting out of high school when that happened. So, um, and then the, um, yeah, that's that was about it. And... Uh, Little did I know that the writing would carry over into the tribal governmental politics and stuff that later on in life. Hmm. So did you go to college? I went when uh, me and my wife got, first got married, went to the, I left here uh, when I was 18, went to the Bay Area and my girlfriend lived up here and, and she worked at uh, one of the um, nursing homes. And um, probably about a year later, uh, she moved down to the Bay Area and we got married, went to Reno and got married. Hmm. And um, we, um, I, uh, This is what happens when I get a little older. I, I, I forget things sometimes. <laughs> um, What's your wife's name? It was Connie. We, we've long since been divorced. Oh, okay. Um, it's been almost 20 years now. And um, she is Hispanic. Hmm. She's one of the Hispanic tribes. And she didn't really acknowledge that and that used to become some of our arguments is that I told her the Hispanic tribes in the south and the the um, English tribes in the north that's the only thing that separates them is their language they're the same people oh and she didn't agree with that so we'd have our debates way back then but now I think everybody knows that so do you have any children I have three children. I have um, Matthew, who's the youngest, uh, Camille, who's the middle child, and 
is the boss. She's about uh, four feet eight, and she bosses these huge brothers of her <laughs> around. <laughs> Aaron's the oldest, and he sits on the tribal council for Scotts Valley. Oh, okay. Yeah, and he's a um, he's been teaching martial arts since he was probably about uh, twenty years old. Now he's uh, forty six, so um, he's been at a long time and. Very good son, very, what I, what I try to instill in my kids is integrity and to address, always address truth, no matter if it hurts. Mm -hmm. And they've done that and I just can't be any more proud of them. Um, very kind to people who they meet, um, but not to the point where they get taken advantage of. You know, they speak their mind and and um, I, I set those guidelines early in them, and uh, I'm just so proud of them, you know. And they have just—I have ten grandchildren that I just think the world of, and and ten. I'm ten yeah. Wow. Oh, I have nine, with one great uh, grandson. Oh wow. Uh, yeah, and uh, they are little characters. I just—I uh, can't spoil them enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, they're all asking me already, uh, Christmas is coming, Grandpa. Um, what do you think Santa's going to bring me? <laughs> I said, we'll have to ask Santa. <laughs> so what was your first job? My first job, um, when I lived here in, in Lake County, Lakeport, was working for the ranches, the pear ranches. I used to set pipe out there for the irrigation. I used to prune uh, different parts of the season and drive tractor uh, forklift actually and moving bins when they were harvesting the pears and take them up to the, uh, to the shed. Um, I did that through my high school days. I used to love doing that. All the kids in high school used to work at that from one time to another. And um, all the Local high school kids used to congregate, congregate at the um, at the pear shed out there in Lake, in Scotts Valley. So it was fun. It was fun back then. And um, Lakeport was a town where it um, was about as close to American Graffiti the movie as as you would think. I mean, they had all these hot rods would come up during the summer and they'd cruise Main Street and Lakeport and Clear Lake. It was um, it was something to see back in those days, and you know, I just had so much fun. You know, I had um, my own '57 Chevy Bel Air, and uh, just met a lot of good people. You know, through the years. You know, as a as a teenager, mm -hmm. and um, really enjoyed special times back in the '65 '66 time, where I had a couple of really nice vehicles and. Yeah, that was a special time. What other jobs have you had? Oh, excuse me. Uh, then I, uh, like I said, I moved to the Bay Area in, when I was 18. And I got a job uh, doing welding. Well, the, my backdrop on welding was from the high school. I took a class for a semester in welding. And I always remember Eric Ingalls, who was a reserve police officer and a teacher, uh, taught that uh, class at uh, Clear Lake Union High. And he taught me how to weld. And I did, I liked it, but I never thought that I would get into it, you know, as a profession, you know. So when I went to um, the Bay Area and I, I applied for this job and got it down there. Um, they asked me if I knew how to weld, and I said, yes, I do, you know, and, and just that small time, I, I got that job, and I worked for that company for 23 years, and I went from a welder in the shop uh, in about six years, and I went to the foreman, foremanship, and then... Um, I was going to go into my own business. I was looking, I was taking the state um, 
uh, state uh, certification test for um, uh, hollow metal repair for doors uh, in industrial uh, industrial doors, steel doors. And um, I was uh, approached by the management. They didn't want me to quit. So they made me a superintendent, superintendent of operations there. So I stayed on eight more years, which even taught me more about running my own business. Hmm. And then once I uh, finally uh, quit there, I went into my own uh, door business where uh, I was a custom repair. I used to do all the big doors for hospitals and, and uh, all the big warehouses and stuff, uh, Safeways and all the big, uh, where they would have supply doors. Mm -hmm. And um, I did very well, did very well in that, in that profession. And um, I kind of miss it, but uh, arthritis has gotten to my hands. So I, I just tinker around with uh, tools now, mm. which um, I'm teaching my grandkids, my older grandkids, how to use tools and stuff, you know, mm -hmm. in case um, their computer uh, interests don't suit them, you know. They're all uh -huh. good at computers. Yeah. So. So what tribe are you affiliated with? The Scotts Valley Band of Pomo Indians. And what do you know about the history of your tribe? Um, the history, we, we were um, put on the, the Sugar Bowl Rancheria in, in 1911. Um, there, I, I don't know the church group who lobbied for us the landless Indians here and after, um, after what happened on Bloody Island. A lot of these tribal people were just wandering and having camps. And um, there was something that happened in the Augustine family where this was the chief bloodline, um, where they separated. And I don't know very much about that. And my grandmother was kind of vague on that. And um, they took up camp out in Scotts Valley, almost to Blue Lakes. That's where they had their big village out there. And the way she, I understood it from her brothers and her, that um, the church groups that were interested in their plight helped them lobby the federal government to get them land where they could have a reservation because there was, they had, had a hard time turning to anybody back then, you know, so. And it was successful and I couldn't tell you which church did that. Um, but our tribe was always uh, plugged into the Catholic church. So it could have possibly been them, but I'm not sure. Mm. Um, and then, like I say, my grandmother was the granddaughter of Chief Augustine, who um, had that run-in with the Kelsey brothers in Kelseyville. Um, the Bloody Island Massacre. And then after that, they took it out on those Indians up there. Mm -hmm. But um, I had, um, see, my grandmother tells told me as a young boy about some of the things about what happened, what actually happened, what she was told by her, these are her direct family members, you know, and what her grandfather participated in. And, and it differs, it differs from what the storyline is that has been publicized. Hmm. But um, some of it's close. Um, I, I have uh, John Parker as a colleague, you know, that I talked with the archaeologists, and he did a, a very good um, uh, presentation on the Kelsey brothers, the Bloody Island thing, and um, I just respect his work on that. Uh, it was pretty accurate, so I, I give John a lot of credit for that. He put on a great presentation. And he does it at the um, Eli Museum, mm -hmm. and he did one at the um, at the courthouse in Lakeport. 
which I attended. A lot of, a lot of school teachers. That's what I enjoyed about that. Were in attendance. Oh. Yes, a lot of school teachers, and that that was in, and uh, Clark was in attendance of that too. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that was um, that was a great presentation. So, when was your tribe federally recognized? 1911. Oh. And where is the tribal property located? The only thing left to the Sugar Bowl Rancheria is one plot, and that is Aggie Elliott's lot. He never sold. Everybody else sold or... Um, and the federal government was kind of brutal, and that's working with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. They took the land out of trust and gave the deeds to the individual family members. Never told them what property taxes were, and they were just victims of real estate um, people, um, people paying pennies on the dollars to get their properties from them. And you know, people would come up and say, here's the $1,000. That was a lot of money back then. And I think some of those properties were sold for like $3,000 hmm. and um, or taken away by property taxes oh. that they couldn't pay. So um, I've made some speeches on that um, in Sacramento and in Washington when I was involved in uh, tribal politics. Um, Yeah, yeah, that, uh, but the, the history of Sugar Bowl, there were um, the Augustine family, and they were, as, as the agreement stated that other landless um, tribal people could, could uh, take residence there if it was approved by the, um, the dominant family. And my grandmother, if she saw somebody in need, she'd help them. That's just the way she was. That's the old Pomo way. And um, we had some of the um, Holder family. Now the Holders, I believe, come from up in Middle Creek, up in Upper Lake. Uh, we had Weston Holder and Ed Holder. And all the, oh, and Belton Barnes. Those were the three families or the two families that were not a part of the Augustine larger family, but they were allowed to stay on the, on the property. Mm. It was 56 acres, 56 point some acres. And um, the, I remember um, my grandma had uh, three brothers on the reservation. It was Byron Augustine, Paul Augustine and Johnny Augustine. And they were the domineering force that governed the, this reservation. Not heavy handedly or anything like that. It was just that you knew you had to talk to them before you could do anything. If you wanted to apply for a piece of land to, to stay in. And back then the Bureau of Indian Affairs didn't help too much with building houses or anything. Um, most of the people had to build just little shacks at that time. Hmm. There was no, the running water was just one line with um, these little faucets out, out in the, just out in the middle of the land. And you had to go there and get your water and bring it back. Um, you had to boil water for, for showers. And this was the emphasis for later on when they sued the Department of Interior to get um, benefits from the federal government. So in a way it was a benefit in disguise, you know, to be in that condition. Um, they had no, no toilets, they had to use odd houses at that time, but other people had to use odd houses too, like in the Valley, uh, Scotts Valley. So that was the, the scene back then when they got um, federally recognized. 
And what it did, it took them out of harm's way. Because back then, people would just come up missing. And as my grandma and my grandfather and my great uncles would tell me that um, they had some people that were camped out in Blue Lakes and um, they were never heard from again. So the, these were the kinds of stuff that was taking place back then. Wow. Yeah. People were, were um, the Pomo people were taken advantage advantage of at a high rate back then. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say I'm so proud of nowadays. And this is my reason for building the Pomo statue, the bronze statue, is because it's a community project. It's to bring people together so we can treat each other like human beings instead of, oh, what separates us. I like to talk to people and commun communicate to them that we're all human beings. We all have kids and cute little kids and we all have our issues in life. And we should work together to, to find a, a better way to, uh, to live together you know, on this planet. Mm -hmm. Because you only get a short period of time to live here in this, in this plane. And like Steve, one day he's here and the next day he's gone. So I, I have to deal him, with him in the spiritual sense. So I'm about community. Uh, early on, I was all Pomo culture and Kato culture. But as you learn about um, human nature, you meet some great people. I've met some great people in my lifetime and from all different cultures. I got the great opportunity to live my young adult life in the Bay Area, which is so diverse. It just taught me all kinds of lessons. When I came back here, when I retired here uh, at uh, 59, I saw a lot of closed-mindedness that was still here from when I left years ago. And it had no, no color to it. It was just um, blinders of people who did the same thing every day, never took a, a broader view of the world. And... Um, um, some of the people I went to school with were still in that mode. Others were, that had gone away and had come back had learned about diversity and learned about the world and they had a broader scope. And uh, that's what I did. I, I learned from other cultures, other people, um, especially in, if you run a business, you get to meet so many different people that you'll learn from each of them. Some bad, some good, you know. But um, I got to experience the Haight-Ashbury experience when I first went down. And I saw some famous people when they weren't famous yet. Oh, so, like who? Oh, yeah. Like yeah. who? Um, Santana, Carlos Santana. I saw Linda Ronstead. I saw Grace Slick. Wow. I, I had a big crush on Grace Slick. I tried to <laughs> always get closer, but I couldn't get close enough to her. But yeah, at Dolores Park, they used to have open sessions of, of, of music. Um, and uh, I just took the time to go and, and venture in and experience that. And I'm glad I did. You know, it was a, I got to see the doors uh, in person with the help of the Hells Angels. <laughs> so, yes, I look back on those things, me and Aggie together, you know, we went to see the doors. And it was a great experience. Uh, anyway, let's move on. Okay. Uh, so talk about the Pomo Indian Statute Project and your involvement with it. Well, one day in 2015, 
It was probably late July. I was coming through town, right where the stop sign is, right at the corner where the museum is. I stopped there and I was about the second from the stop sign going north. And I just glanced over and I noticed the, the um, wooden statues of the police and fire statues that were in place. And I just said, you know, what a nice idea. And then I looked over and saw that blank spot on the north lawn of the museum. And I said, boy, that would be a perfect place for a, a Pomo statue. And I'm not too shy. So I pulled in there and pulled in one of the stalls and I went up and uh, I asked for the curator at that time. And his name was Perisky. I always have a hard time pronouncing them. Anton Perisky. Mm -hmm. And he came out uh, or uh, came down and, and uh, the receptionist introduced me to him. And then I met John Johnson. And I've known John Johnson from before. He's a, a Wyatt Indian. And um, very educated man. Very, and he always had the, Big black cowboy hat on his dressed all in all in black all the time, cowboy boots. And um, he was our rendition of Johnny Cash, you know, in the native community. <laughs> and I used to tease him about that. But anyway, we went upstairs and sat down and discussed that, the possibilities of that. And they liked the idea. They go, Yeah, that he goes, that would open up the Pomo exhibits in in the museum to where people would want to come in and see more. I said, that's what I'm, kind of what I'm talking about here. We'd get tourists out of their cars instead of just driving through and going to the casinos, one of the casinos, they would actually stop and look at, uh, in the shops, you know, to what we have available here and, and uh, go into the museum. Mm -hmm. And uh, they love that concept. So we formed a committee, the, Tribal Advisory Committee, and um, I and John and Millie Simon, uh, she was an early member. We had some younger people, but they they didn't take too much interest in it. Um, I don't know why, but um, a lot of them know their culture, know the languages from different uh, tribes around the lake. But for some reason, it just didn't catch on with them. I knew this was going to be a long haul to do this project. So, um, so we went forward. Uh, we, we started our meetings and started uh, chronicling our minutes and all this stuff. And, and um, we stuck to it. I said, no matter what, we've got to stick to this. So uh, Mr. Perisky resigned. He had another uh, interest that he wanted to pursue in Southern California. So we wished him the best and he wished us the best. And he, I think he gave us some support letters. And then we, the temporary um, curator was Whitney. Why is her name? P uh, Petrie? Petrie, she came on and she was a dynamo. She started setting up the, the meeting um, housekeeping about the bylaws and stuff like that. So we got that done and then we established, um, we start talking about the statue and how to protect it in the future once it was built. And she had a lot of input on that. And, and I don't know what happened, but um, she was re uh, replaced and uh, Clark came on. And Clark came on with a lot of knowledge about grant writing. And um, he had some good ideas how to do fundraising um, and to take it to the Board of Supervisors to reserve the plot of land to put it on. Mm. So I, I appreciate that about him. So you did the first drawings of the statue, oh, yeah. right? Yes, yes. 
I did the first drawings to get the um, get the uh, <clears throat> people together to have something to compare it to, you know, and and um, talk about. And I knew it would change over the time that when people put in their comments about it, and um, I was fine with that. There was a uh, some of the members that came on later had some political views about what it should stand for. And I said, and I kept saying, no, this is a community project. It's not the tribes because they never came up with the idea. I came up with the idea. It's to heal the cultures, to bring people together. And everybody is welcome. I would like to see a little plaza out there in front of the statue where people make public statements. If they're running for office, if they're running for city council or or the Board of Supervisors, they can do it right from there. Hmm. And cameras can pick up in the background this beautiful statue about Pomo culture. So I said, it's for everybody. It's a community. And I would like to see in the future, at somewhere on that grounds, the pear farmers, because they were a big part of making this county what it, what it is today. Pear farmers, um, they just dominated this, this county. It was some of the finest pears in the world that were right here in Lake County. Hmm. And we used to take a lot of, I would like to see a statue of a tractor with a farmer on it and uh, symbolizing a, a pear because that's what drove this, pears and walnuts. So that could be a, a future project, depending how this one goes for me. I'd like to not lead it so much as introduce it, you know. Mm -hmm. Do you know how much money's been raised so far? Um, we, we're about halfway there. I think we, I think we need about uh, pretty close to $50,000 yet. Oh, okay. I, I recently uh, got uh, $1,300. Uh, I think it was last week, donated. Oh. And then I've uh, started communications outside the county now because uh, the COVID really hurt our effort to raise funding as it did, you know, clear across the world, around the world. Mm -hmm. um, but it really took a, I had so many appointments that uh, I was going to follow up on and I've had to reestablish those. So I'm in the fund, uh, fundraising mode, so that's, that's what has to be done on this. Uh, we talked about the details today, and there were about four details of extending the, um, the headdress down a little further, closer to the eyes, extending the feathers on the a male dancer a little longer, things of that sort, and uh, the baskets that are on the ground. But it's, it's turning out really beautiful really beautiful. I'm really proud of that. Um, Rolf, uh, the sculptor, him and his friend uh, Thomas are amazing, amazing artists. So I'm really happy with their work. So you were the chairman of the Central California BIA agency. How did you get involved with that? Um, it's the Central California agency under the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Sacramento. They have the agency and the area office. The, area, the agency is just the Central Cal. They have a Northern California agency and a Southern California agency. The area office controls all three. They're the, they're the executive branch. And um, I actually went to a budget meeting where I would just a new chairman of the Scotts Valley Band of Pomo Indian in 1994. And I went there not knowing anything about tribal government. And I was uh, actually, Iggy Elliott came and asked me after he got the, the uh, land re-recognized in 1992. He said, but I need some help on this. He goes, because I don't understand a lot of this stuff. 
because you run a business, you probably can understand more than I said, tribal government, I really never even um, took an interest in that part of it. But I went to a budget meeting after I was elected chairman. And uh, we had a good uh, administrator back then. And some of the stuff I didn't understand, she would explain the best she could. So um, I saw what the Bureau of Indian Affairs was doing at the time. They, they had some misleading um, budget items where they were charging a tribe called Timbashaw in the middle of Death Valley. They were charging them to run their forestry. There's no trees out there in the middle of Death Valley. Hmm. So that got my interest going and I started talking to some tribal leaders and they said, would you consider running next year? And I said, I, I would do that. I have to learn a lot more before I can do stuff like that. And, and I said, but you speak up. Nobody else will speak up. So I said, I'll consider it. And I'll, I'll let the tribes in my area, the 52 tribes, I'll let them know. So um, the next year came and the, our administrator and uh, the secretary said, you promised them that you would consider running. So she goes, they're going to be looking at you. to." So I went all the way up to the front, uh, right by the podium where the BIA and, and the current officials from the tribes were. And I put my name on the board that I was going to run. Oh, excuse me. There were about three names there pretty prominent leaders from different um, tribes. Then I went up there, and I was still hesitant. I was intimidated because I didn't know enough about it. So I put my name down. And it took about 10 minutes. And then I noticed these tribal leaders, they got up and they took their names off the board. So they elected me unopposed. Oh. And I was... That was a very special moment in my life where um, you get the ultimate compliment just on your word, just on what you do. And um, I always think about that time. I always think about that feeling. I was just blown away. And um, for somebody to have that much confidence in me and I really just getting to know what tribal government was all about, you know, and dealing with the the federal government. Mm -hmm. So, big moment for me. And, and then I was elected, you have to get elected each year by the 52 tribes. They elected me four years in a row. Oh, I, wow. could, I could have did a fifth, but I had to have spinal surgery. And I was really, really pushing it at that point. And I told them I couldn't run again because it involves a lot of traveling. I went to Washington, I think about probably about 10 times oh. and uh, all over the state meetings and and it was just a wondrous time in my life and if I did that now I would probably have been more effective on paper because I really didn't know a lot of the stuff back then uh, but I just got my information from tribal constitutions and the jargon that the BIA gave me to read about advisory. And I got to where the tribes trusted me so much, they elected me to the advisory board for the area office mm. that conflicted with some of the, the directors at that level. But um, I showed the tribes that they had power and they utilized it. Some utilized it in a, in a bad way. Um, 
after gaming came in. Um, I actually did some of the language to protect the non-gaming tribes when uh, Gray Davis, the governor Gray Davis, was in, in, in office. And he had sent his advisors to take notes on a big meeting we had right across from the Capitol at one of the hotels, or it could have been the Hyatt. And they asked if we had input on the gaming tribes giving um, the non-gaming tribes a fair share of money, or if they could be accountable for that money. And I, I said, I don't think that would work. So I would think that the, there has to be a system where the non-gaming tribes are treated directly from the state. Hmm. And that's the way it is today. And there was um, Chairman Atwell from Lemore and Chairman Anderson from Robinson who agreed with me on, on that particular time they were sitting right there. Hmm. So it changed it, and uh, I'm glad we did it that way, because who knows what would have happened. So you were also the tribal chairman of the Scotts Valley Pomo Indians in the 90s. Yes. What was that like? Well, that was uh, the Scotts Valley Band of <coughs> uh, Pomo Indians. It was, just like I say, when Eggy got the, land, uh, the tribe's uh, federal recognition back by going to court with the California Indian Legal Services. See, nobody wanted to represent us, but Steve Elliott, Steve Eggy Elliott, took it as his mission to constantly badger the California Indian Legal Service, which was a, a group of uh, attorneys that worked for the tribes. He was constantly giving them information and pressuring them to take the case on, looking for something in the Termination Act when they terminated our, our reservation, Sugar Bowl, find some way to develop a case to get it re-recognized. And they finally did. He submitted a, a uh, letter to them stating that the services that the BIA provided were incomplete, like putting um, toilets in the houses, and they ran uh, plumbing lines that were not finished. They ran them to nowhere. They ran them into septic tanks that weren't even functioning that were below the water level of the creek. So based on that, that's how we won that case. Hmm. We took it clear to, to Washington, D.C., and they finally won that case in 1992. Hmm. And that was because of Steve Eggie Elliott, his determination to get that done. And um, he was not treated too, too good by the, the current tribe tribal members, because a lot of these members came from outside the area mm. and um, don't understand Sugar Bowl, where we grew up and we lived, me and Eggy. So that's sad. That's really sad when people don't understand what it took to get here. So I just wish they would respect, and I say this about all cultures, respect the, the elders' knowledge you know, you, you got this, it's like having a cassette filled with all this knowledge and then you don't want to watch it. That's what I, I see of elders. They have all this information, all this knowledge, a whole lifetime. And you don't even want to hear it. See, when I was a little kid, I used to sit there and listen to all the elders, their stories. And I was just amazed by some of my great uncles, those three brothers, the Augustines. And the nicest one, Paul, he was the easiest one to get along with. He was a mercenary in Russia, and I never knew that about him. 
but he was the nicest guy in the world. I didn't know he, he was a mercenary. And um, the other two were kind of grumpy old men, but I still learned things from them. I took the time to listen, and they liked to talk, so they gave me information and direction in life as a young kid. Yeah, Byron was the more businessman. He had a business, and I can't remember what it was, but he always had a brand new car, always dressed up, and he was the only one like that on the reservation. And then Johnny, Johnny was, um, Johnny got in trouble a long time ago, back in the early, I would say, 1914, 15. Yeah, he got uh, involved in a, in a shootout with a, a sworn enemy from up in Upper Lake somewhere. And um, he spent 24 years in prison. Mm. But um, he, um, growing up around him, he told me a lot of stories. He used to just read, just read anything that was put in front of him. But he taught me about dressing. He would just dress to the tee all the time. And uh, on the reservation that you just didn't see that. You know, people would just go and work clothes around town and stuff. Not him. He dressed up. Nice hat all the time. Hmm. So I learned those things from him. And uh, he seemed like a very troubled person, though, growing up, as I remember. But um, I took knowledge from him. And, um, yeah, Augustines are a very unique family line. Very unique. You're involved with the Circle of Minds group. What is that? It's an elders group that we're just establishing. Uh, Thomas Brown used to be the director there, and Thomas has some medical issues now. He had a stroke, and he's got some medical issues going on, so he retired. And um, I believe we were going to hire one of his um, one of his family members that is uh, qualified to do that. And um, what it is is tapping on to that knowledge that the elders have. It gives us a forum to do that, to be constructive at our age into the community. And to, we can take issues to the tribal councils of all the tribes around the lake because we know how to do that because we sat on councils before. Mm -hmm. We know the whole structure of it. We know the do's and the don'ts. And to help the younger kids with some of these mental challenges that they face on reservations. I could say the suicides on reservations are astronomical. And the addictions, uh, drug addictions, it, it's, a, it's a marketplace for, for drug dealers. And that has to stop. That just has to stop. So we're leaning, giving our knowledge to fight this in a constructive way because there's a lot of people who talk about it but never do it. All of this is talk. And sometimes you get your feelings hurt in those meetings because the elders don't have time to play games. They just speak their mind. And I... I warn guests who come and um, other elders who are just setting in that sometimes it's straight to the point. You just have to be able to listen and take in what you can about the subject matter. So it's working pretty good. It's working really well, in fact. And we got some bright young um, native gals that are working there and doing all the technology for us to get our messages out. 
Mm. So it's it's a it's a if it wasn't constructive, I wouldn't be doing it because I just don't believe in spinning spinning my wheels. It's got to be some kind of construct constructive um, process. Mm -hmm. So I really enjoy those. Uh, tomorrow we got one. Um, so. So what kinds of stuff do you like to write? Uh, to write? Yeah. Um, we just finished the, the book, which uh, former museum uh, employee John Johnson and Pamela Hale started. And they ran into, well, after John's passing, uh, the book stalled and was going to fail. And so Pamela asked me if, if I could do some troubleshooting in the political arena to the, some of the problems that they were having. And then my input into the book, as well as Steve Elliott's, uh, Iggy Elliott and Thomas. Uh, so we did that. Um, some of the collaborators didn't want their names mentioned. And their names were written down, so it caused problems. So um, I helped relieve those types of things in the process. And it took about a year to kind of clean that stuff up and, and put the Scotts Valley bands um, stories from, from my grandfather and grandmother in there. So it's on Amazon now. Oh. Yeah. Uh, two Perspectives of Lake County Pomo History. And it's a rebuttal to Mr. Bancroft, who wrote a lot of books or who was in charge of some of his writers doing propaganda books against the Pomo culture hmm. that were not true. And so it was our chance to do a rebuttal to straighten out um, things that were said that had no basis. And that was how propaganda was used against Native people back then, so you can dehumanize them. And that was to make it OK to your own culture that it was okay to do what you did to these other uh, the Pomo culture and the other native cultures. It was politics. It was brute force. Um, that's why I, I just stress now communication. Because when you communicate, those people in the old days that would listen to this propaganda, when you communicate, you talk to them and you take this avenue away from the people who would do those evil things. Mm -hmm. So I believe in communication. Communication is the strongest tool in this world. If you don't have it, then violence happens, everything happens when you don't communicate. So that's what I stress to my grandchildren. You communicate. You don't take the problems to bed with you. You talk about them. Mm -hmm. So that's my, um, those are, the book and the statue are probably my last projects. My final project in, in this lifetime is teaching my grandkids. Then they can teach as they go. Um, I'm just so proud of them. I'm just so proud of my sons for being great dads. Um, they used to get tired of hearing me talk about being a dad. And now they're using that same language. <laughs> mm. I hope it ain't uh, propaganda to them. <laughs> but uh, uh, 
I'm all about family. I just love family. What would you describe as the best day of your life? I've had so many best days of my life that I don't think there's one. One of those is what I just told you when I, I ran unopposed to the uh, chairman of the Central California Policy Committee, because that's a big deal. And when you have established tribal leaders who had talked to you the year before, go up there and take their name off the board and you're unopposed. It, it just, I, I, I got choked up when that happened to me. And, and then when I finally took the oath that the standing ovation, which is, it was one of my great days. The other days is when my kids were born and then the grandkids, those are my greatest days. Yeah. And what's the best advice you could give future generations? The truth. Always tell the truth, no matter if it hurts, it's going to make you look bad. Um, tell the truth. Because if you don't tell the truth, then what are you talking about? What are you talking about? You're talking about somebody's lie or something somebody made up? Tell the truth. Everything has to be based on the truth. And don't make yourself look good by telling a fib. Tell the truth. I preach this over and over to my, to my, um, my kids and my grandkids. Because, like I say, and respect your elders. Listen to your elders. They have a wealth of knowledge. And, it, and at one time, I was guilty of this. Saying, yeah, yeah, I'll listen to them in my mid-twenties. I didn't listen too well in my mid-twenties. And I hate to admit that, but I didn't, because there were so many things going on. And I was a little light on my attention span. But I had enough in the tank from my elders when I was growing up to come back and listen again. So my message to the next generation is listen to your elders, always tell the truth, and look forward. Don't always look backwards. I tell this to um, generations already in the Native community. People are always going back to ceremony from their ancestors. That's just a part of it. That's one segment. Don't make that your life looking backwards. Because if you keep looking backwards, somebody might be gaining on you. And that doesn't come from me. That comes from um, Satchel Page. He was an old Negro uh, pitcher in the Negro Leagues. I always love that saying. But don't look, always look back. You've got to look forward, too. You've got to look forward, take care of the business there, then you can handle the archives. Make sure it's archives. It's not everything you believe. It's just a segment. Mm -hmm. So that, that, would be my, that would be my advice to the next generation. Is there anything else you'd like to share? Um, I think I, I go back to, we have to get, as a Native society, who are dependent nations, we are dependent nations, as it states in the Constitution, that we have to know more about the process of the U.S. government, the federal government, and the state government. Because our tribal governments don't have the expertise right now. 
they base their expertise on administrations, hire, hired people that come in. And that's not a good thing. We need to get more educated young people into colleges so that they can run their own nation. They can run their own government. As long as we depend on non-native administrative people, we are going to face the same scenario over and over. I've dealt a long time with uh, tribal governments, with federal governments and state government. I was one of the um, lead people that finally got the state government to the table. The state government would never deal with tribal governments. They just ignored us. Hmm. Back in 95, I believe, we got them to the table because of the water issue here in the Yolo um, water project that was part of Clear Lake and all the water systems in California. And there was, I believe, $6 billion of money in that budget. And it started then, but it, I, I worked on it with um, a number of people. And a lot of it was trying to communicate with the state government because they didn't want to give us a voice in the process. Hmm. But the federal government said no. The tribal governments have to weigh in on this. So I, I told you in 99, my, my spine had to be operated on. And gaming was just coming into the scene. And this big water project was right there. And I couldn't hold out long enough. And I, I didn't run for the um, policy committee anymore. I gave that up because I had to have this operation. And then gaming was coming on board. And we didn't know what to expect then. And the 52 tribes, we had a meeting in, in Lake Tahoe. What are we going to do when it comes to gaming? Because the Northern California and Southern California were pressuring us to sign on to it so that we could um, be one force talking to the state. And I just put it out on the floor. And I think it passed by two votes. Hmm. It wasn't a done deal, but it passed. And because uh, I was being pressured all the time by different Southern California tribes, big tribes. And um, I said it had to be a vote of the people, the vote of the tribes. I can't decide this, not one person. So they, they agreed. And that's how Central Cal came to put casinos on properties. And yeah. um, it's worked. I would say it's been 80% positive, but there still is a lot to be desired. Um, and I think tribes are finding out there's different ways to uh, establish businesses that could um, benefit the tribes. Um, they've got to quit depending, like I say, on administrating staff that dictate. So I think tribes are learning that now. And hopefully in my lifetime, I'll see it, see it working. But the younger people need to get educated. Priority, educate yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I've always spoken to the point, spoken direct. I put a lot of people on, on blast, as my daughter says. But you have to, if you're going to control, have some kind of control. Because tribal sovereignty is used 
It's used as a credit card by intellectual people with um, the intent to make money. And I'm, I'm tired of seeing that. The people have to be helped because it's the people who vote these tribal councils in and the tribal councils hire people. It's their responsibility to make sure they hire somebody good that's going to benefit all the members. So otherwise it's just the same old thing. So um, I would just like to take the last minute here to talk about Iggy Elliott and what he had done. None of this Scotts Valley Band of Pomos would be in place if it wasn't for him. And he was, didn't make a lot of money, had car problems at some points in his effort to, and he would walk, hitchhike, like to the Bay Area, to Ukiah, to meetings where the California Indian Legal Service was at. He would walk there hmm. or hitchhike there. And it came up at his services when uh, I was doing the eulogy for him. A couple of his um, peers came up and reiterated that story about the effort it took for him to, to do that. And um, other people are trying to take that credit. And they're just, it's alarming to think there are people that think that way. That's why um, you've got to respect your elders. So I am very thankful that Steve Eggy got me involved because I think I took on something that maybe he wouldn't have been successful in. But he did the, he did the troubleshooting. He did that hard part. And that took a lot. I remember being at, the, at uh, the federal building in San Francisco when they made the final decision that we won the case. It was amazing. But I give him all the credit. He's the one that did it. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I love who I am. I love being a Pomo Cato. And I take pride in that. But I respect my community. Because I'm about the human being. I'm not just about one culture. And my grandma said, the greatest thing you can do in life is to do for others. So I'll end it there. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today and for sharing your stories. Thank you.